everyone, I'm Kevin, the Lights Forum, BX257, here to bring you another 1980s and 90s G.I. Joe tour review. And for this second Iron Grenadiers theme month, we're going to be taking a look at 1980s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-1990s-
just taking a look at Metalhead without all these accessories on him, which admittedly do obscure just a main figure. He is actually really nice. I like the sculpt. It's very detailed but practical, a lot of harnesses and stuff. And I really like the color scheme because it is mostly black with pops of red. And you could consider the, um, the yellow visor and maybe yellow rockets be part of the gold, which is really the standard of the Iron Grandier's color schemes. But of course, he also has little pops of the light gray, which to me is perfectly fine because it represents the metallic look of his accessories. Taking a closer look at him, you'll notice that he actually has long hair which covers his ears, which is something that the comic books and the cartoons actually took advantage of, giving him kind of a wild haircut or kind of a mullet. However, I will say that he's actually missing a lot of paint apps. You'll notice that he has this red stitch work going up the bottom portion of his legs here. And I think that these are supposed to be legs, not really boots, because I think the whole thing is supposed to be a blast suit. But that stitch work actually continues up his legs, but they haven't picked those out in red. And it actually stops where this sort of clamp-like device is supposed to connect to the leg missile packs, but they haven't picked those out in gray like the rest of these portions of the connectors. As a matter of fact, a lot of the techno detail is actually really washed out because it isn't picked out in a lighter color. And continuing on with the red stitch work, you can actually see that on the back of his arms. It's supposed to go down the back of his arms. Now, normally Hasbro doesn't uh, color in the elbow portion. I don't think they really could. But you can see that it actually the, the stitch work actually does continue onto this portion right by his elbow. And they haven't picked that out in red either. I'm not too bothered about the non-continuation of the paintwork here. But there is one thing that, once I've seen it, it's really hard for me to ignore it. But the fact is, is that this red portion around his collar is actually supposed to go up like a turtleneck. And you can see that they've actually sculpted in the bottom of the turtleneck here, but they haven't painted that in. I really wish they would have just eliminated the red paintwork here and used that budget and moved it over here for his neck. But one good positive thing is, is that they've actually done the um, crosshairs on his goggles really well. Which is actually something that they tried with the undertoes. That's what the one eye thing on the undertoed mask was supposed to be. It was supposed to have a crosshair on top of all that. But because of the rubberiness of the um, material that they used for his mask, it was kind of mushy and washed out. And I didn't really kind of notice it at first. But here, because of its much... Um, harder plastic. It's a really well done crosshairs, despite the fact that it's actually painted over twice, I think. While the Iron Grenadiers are an all-new army and sub-team, most of them don't take after anybody else, obviously. But that's not true in the case of Metalhead. There is a preceding figure for him. He takes after the 1984 Scrap Iron. Yeah, I know, a lot of people tend to think of Scrap Iron as actually being a Cobra. I mean, he goes with a Cobra symbol right there on his arm. But if you read his file card, he totally worked for Destro, and specifically for Mars. And that is basically what Iron Grenadiers are. They are employees of Mars and Destro's personal weapons testers. So who would Metalhead's opposite number on the G.I. Joe team be? Well, as the anti-tank trooper, he is most likely going up against any of the mechanized G.I. Joes or any of the um, individual tanks that there are. But if you wanted to go against a G.I. Joe who specializes in the same thing, obviously his opposite number would be the 1990 Salvo, the G.I. Joe's anti-armor trooper. Who, in the comic books, they actually did face off against each other. So there is a genuine rivalry between these two. 
Oddly enough, most of the heavy weapon G.I. Joes actually have conventional handheld weaponry. So if you really want to compare Metalhead to somebody who actually had the weapons fixed onto his body, like an entire system, the 1987 Fast Draw is a good comparison. Metalhead comes with 14 individual parts in order to make them complete. So while that may sound like a really daunting task if you're looking for one on the aftermarket, I wouldn't have to really worry all that much because he is a heavily produced figure and all of his accessories are really sturdy. The only thing you might want to look out for is whether the backpack frame is included. Uh, some people tend to forget photographing the underside of the um, backpack missile launcher and they sometimes leave that on there and it could be hard to see whether that part is still on there or not. It's just something to look out for rather than something that's often missing. It's just something that's often not photographed. So you do have to watch out for that. But Metalhead still commands a bit of a higher price on the aftermarket versus the other figures um, that he was contemporary with. One of the reasons, unfortunately, is even though he comes with a lot of accessories, they're fairly easy to find, and the accessories themselves are really sturdy, it's actually the figure which is very fragile. Unfortunately, these leg pegs are often broken off. And even worse than those are the pegs that are on his back. Because, again, sellers rarely take pictures of the back of the figure, so you can't even see whether the back pegs are broken off or not. But those are also fairly fragile. I'm sure that there's a fix for that, and I might make a fix video for any metalhead figure which has broken pegs, but that's something that's in the future, and a lot of people really don't want to customize their figures or fix their figures. They want something which is um, basically untouched. In an effort to fix the peg breakage problem, later versions of the figures came with thicker and shorter leg pegs. Unfortunately, this came too late in production, and North American releases of the fix are rare, but standard on foreign releases. In the UK and Europe, the releases trailed behind North America by about a year. Hasbro UK saw the popularity of the spring-loaded gimmicks being introduced and decided to upgrade the 1990 figures upon second release. Metalhead's first release is the same as the North American version, but the second release includes the glider drone borrowed from the 1991 Cobra Commander. All the second release gimmick upgraded figures are popular with collectors seeking variants. And yes, these figures include the much needed thicker leg pegs, even though there's now nothing to connect them to. Metalhead's name was reused in 1995 for a good guy in the G.I. Joe Extreme series. Personally, I thought this was too soon to reuse a name, much less give it to a character of an opposing faction, since it was only a year apart from the 1994 Battlecore Cobra version.
rather ironic, seeing as taking a look at Metalhead without all this uh, six rack. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.